Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and this episode is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 169 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Tomorrow is January 17, 2018, which will mark the 312th birthday of Benjamin Franklin. So I think we should use this anniversary as an opportunity to embark on a detailed exploration of Franklin's long life. I mean, he is, after all, the namesake of this podcast. Now, there are many aspects of Franklin's life that we could explore, but today we're going to focus our attention on his faith and religion. Thomas Kidd, a professor of history at Baylor University, has written a book called Benjamin Franklin, The Religious Life of a Founding Father. And in that book, he tells us that while we remember Franklin as a printer, scientist, and statesman, we can't truly know or understand his life unless we also take the time to explore and understand his faith and religious beliefs. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take the time to understand Franklin as a man of faith. And as we conduct our investigation, Thomas reveals details about deism and whether Benjamin Franklin was a deist. The impact Franklin's upbringing in a devout Puritan household had on his life and ideas about faith and religion. And information about how Franklin continually grappled with ideas about virtue, morality, and theology. But first, do you receive the Ben Franklin's World Listener newsletter? It's largely a weekly email that alerts you to a new episode in its show notes. But every once in a while, I use it to send out information regarding meetups and other opportunities that you may find of interest. Plus, the Listener Newsletter is your ticket to join our exclusive listener community on Facebook. To join the list and the community, text BFWORLD to 33444 or visit BenFranklinsWorld.com. Okay, are you ready to ring in Ben Franklin's birthday with an exploration of his religious life? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian and expert guide. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a distinguished professor of history at Baylor University. His research interests are in 18th century North America, particularly in the history of evangelicalism, and he's the author of eight books, including George Whitfield, America's Spiritual Founding Father, and most recently, Benjamin Franklin, The Religious Life of a Founding Father. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Thomas Kidd. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us. We're really excited to mark Ben Franklin's birthday with an exploration of his religious life. Now, in the introduction to Benjamin Franklin, the religious life of a founding father, Thomas notes that we remember Franklin as a printer, scientist, and statesman, but we don't actually know much about his faith. Thomas, many historians have called Franklin a deist, which is how he described himself. Would you tell us about deism and whether Franklin was really a deist? That's right. He called himself a deist in his autobiography, so I think that's a pretty good place to start with what his religious views were. But it turns out that in the 18th century, deism could mean a lot of different things. It could mean everything from a really radical anti-Christian skepticism to a kind of mild, you know, doubts about some traditional Christian doctrines that some deists would still affirm things like the providence of God working in the world and so forth. And it certainly wasn't atheism for the deists. And so I think it can be hard to understand what Franklin exactly meant by being a deist. I mean, if he was a deist, then, for instance, why was he the one, as some of your listeners may know the story about him proposing that the Constitutional Convention open its sessions with prayer? That seems a little strange for a conventional deist. If we think of deism as people who don't believe in God's providential role in the world, then why would a deist be proposing prayer? But I think the closer that you look at Franklin's beliefs, especially as he got older and into the revolutionary period, I think that he is still a deist, but he's the kind of deist that still believes that somehow God is involved in human affairs and that something like prayer might actually do something. We may not know exactly what good it does for us, but at the Constitutional Convention, I think he believed that 
if they prayed that at least it would become kind of a source of unity and it would remind them that they needed to work together for the good of the nation. And so that's the kind of deist he was, and that's why he called himself a deist in his autobiography. It's really true that we can often see religion at play in early America, even in things like the early American economy, where people around British North America and the Atlantic world actually created trade networks based solely on the fact that they shared the same faith with someone else. Right. It's everywhere, even for people who we might view as sort of more secular. We know more and more all the time, for instance, that the Virginia colony was just shot through with ideas and motivations about religion, even though you wouldn't say that it was founded for religious reasons the way, say, the Massachusetts was. So it's sort of the fish and water thing. I mean, it's the world that they lived in was deeply religious. And so even for someone like Franklin, who's definitely becoming more skeptical in his teens and early adulthood, the the way that he made sense of the world that he lived in and explained what was happening in his life and his printing interests and on and on and on, religion just comes up naturally in that world all the time. Now, you see Franklin as having developed a distinctly American kind of religion. And I wonder if you would tell us more about this religion, which you termed in your book as doctrineless, moralized Christianity. Right. So Franklin grows up in a very traditional religious family, Puritan family in Boston. But as I suggested, he's becoming more skeptical, especially about some of the very specific doctrinal tenets of the Puritans are involved with Calvinism. He doesn't ever give up on the value of religion for society, for himself, but he thinks that too many Christians spent too much time worried about particularities of doctrine, things like whether people are predestined to be saved and to go to heaven or not, those kind of things that denominations, churches, pastors just fought too much about those kind of issues, bickered about biblical interpretation. And he thought that they were losing what was truly valuable about religion, which was that religion was the greatest source of virtue and benevolence, charity, these kinds of things in the world. And so he thought, and in this, he's like a number of deists, that really the focus of religion should be virtue and action, not so much doctrine and belief. Now, he would concede that if you believe in the grace of God and the charity of God to people, that that may make you more service-oriented and charitable yourself. So he wouldn't say that you don't need to believe anything, but he tended to want to say that virtually all belief, all doctrine is kind of optional. It may help you to live the right kind of life if you believe certain things about God, but your belief should be mostly private, and you certainly shouldn't fight about doctrinal issues. But you should spend most of your time as a religious person focused on what good that you can do in the world. And I think that this, I call this doctrinalist, moralized Christianity, because in it, doctrine becomes almost totally secondary and optional. I suppose we really do have to be a theist to believe in this kind of religion. But other than that, you know, ideas about the divinity of Christ and these kind of things, you know, you can have opinions about that, but you better not fight with other people about it, because you need to get busy with the work of taking care of the poor and ministering to the sick and giving to various charitable projects. And that was the essence of religion. And so that's the part where it's moralized in the sense that the whole focus of this kind of religion is in morality and virtue. Thomas just mentioned Franklin's childhood in Boston and his Calvinist faith. And I'd really like for us to explore both of these aspects of Franklin's life further. But before we dive into specifics about Franklin's life and the evolution of his ideas about religion and faith, I really think we should talk about sources of information. Thomas, how do you, as a historian of religion, go about researching someone's faith? Would you tell us about the sources you use to trace the origins and development of Franklin's religious faith? Well, with Franklin, it's relatively straightforward because we have the wonderful works of Benjamin Franklin series that's come out from Yale University Press. And so I think that the printed volumes at this point run to about 41 volumes. And then most of the rest of his papers are in an online, publicly available edition. And so those volumes are each one of them, four or 500 pages. They're indexed. The online version is full-text searchable. And so 
For me, it was a fairly straightforward matter, though laborious in its way, of going through Franklin's papers and looking for every single reference that I could find to religion, God, the Bible, virtue, any of these kind of topics. And with the help of doctoral students here at Baylor, we put together a master list of every reference that we could find. And it runs into the thousands of references for sure. Going into the project, I did have a little concern about whether there was going to be enough to go on to write something. Now, this is a biography. It's a full biography, but it's focused, obviously, on religion. So I wondered, is there really enough material there? And I had no reason for that concern, as it turned out, because it's just a flood of material. He's constantly writing about religion, especially just phrases, references to religion. But it also turns out that he probably wrote more as an author about religion than any other layperson in 18th century America, or at least published more about religion than any other layperson in 18th century America. So at that point, it was really more of an exercise of how do I organize all this material? And some of it, of course, is repetitive. So, you know, telling a story that was comprehensive but not overwhelming to get that composite picture of what he thought about religion. So that's basically how I did it. Are primary sources about faith written by the person that you're studying really the best way to get out a person's religious beliefs? I mean, is there anything that we need to keep in mind as we look at a source like Franklin's writings when he says, you know, I believe this or I believe that? Well, I think you always have to be mindful of what this source is being written for. And so if you see Franklin saying things in an entirely private capacity in a private letter that he does not expect to be circulated, you might expect in that case a little more candor. The autobiography, as wonderful as it is, is obviously one of the most popular autobiographies that's ever been written, is also written very much for public consumption to make a certain kind of impression about him, as any of us would write. If we could write a published autobiography, it would be stylized. That's not to say that Franklin isn't truthful in his autobiography. I think he tries to be, but he leaves a lot of things out. For instance, there is, as far as I know, no reference to his sister Jane Mecom in his autobiography, who I think might have been certainly one of the two most influential Christians in his adult life. And it's the sibling that he was the closest to who would, for decades, talk to him about religious topics. And he doesn't even mention her in the autobiography, which I think is an unfortunate slight in a number of ways. So you have to realize that things that are being published for a certain purpose is a different kind of source than, say, a private letter that he doesn't really expect anyone to see but the recipient. Okay, so now let's turn to Franklin's childhood and upbringing. Born in Boston on January 17, 1706, as the 10th child of Josiah Franklin and Abia Folger, Franklin grew up as the child of devout Puritans. Thomas, would you tell us about Franklin's childhood in Boston and about the role religion played in his childhood? Sure. He grows up in, as you suggested, this Puritan family that's quite devout. His father is a candle maker. So their tradespeople, relatively modest, and their families had come to New England for religious purposes in order to be able to practice their faith in freedom. Franklin and his siblings grow up in an intensely religious environment where the Bible and Christian practice are very much at the center of their family's lives. I mean, they work, and then they're going to church maybe for three meetings a week, maybe more sometimes. And over a lifetime in that kind of environment, you certainly would hear thousands of sermons. And Franklin heard many, many while he was still at home through his mid-teens. And these sermons would often be heavily doctrinal, could be quite lengthy, an hour, two hours. It's not unusual. Line-by-line preaching of the biblical text. So Franklin is deeply, deeply immersed in Puritan piety. Puritan beliefs and the Bible itself. He says in the autobiography that he had read the Bible all the way through by the time he was five. That's quite an accomplishment for a five-year-old, maybe one of the places where I'm not totally sure I believe him. But he was a very bookish boy, and the Bible was one of the only books that he had ready access to at that age. And his parents would have been very pleased with him for reading the Bible on his own. So who knows, maybe he did read it all the way through by the time he was five. 
But that left a monumental impression on his mind of that deep familiarity with the text of Scripture. So even though he doubts parts of what he had learned when he was growing up about the Bible and doctrine, he kind of can't get away from that biblical inheritance in his rhetoric, just the way that he would talk. He was constantly making allusions to the Bible, especially with other people like John Adams, for instance, who knew the Bible as well as he did. It almost becomes a kind of second language to them. That's so constant are the references to the Bible. He used the Bible as his most common source of anecdotes and similes, and it was also one of his most common sources of jokes. He would play jokes on people who he knew didn't know the Bible as well as he did. And he would show them a passage, and they would say, oh, don't you know this is from the book of Genesis or something? And it wasn't. It was something he had made up. And they would say, oh, yes, yes, I remember. <laughs> and he would laugh at them, you know, and he would know that he knew the Bible better than they did, than most of his friends. So it's very intense, and it has a profound influence on Franklin for the rest of his life, even though by the time he's in his mid-teens, he's well on his way to becoming a deistic skeptic. So Franklin knew the Bible. He attended sermons with his family for hours on end. But what exactly was the doctrine and the interpretations of the Bible that Franklin would have come to understand? I mean, what were the Puritans talking and preaching about in early New England? Well, there's a lot of overlap with you know, basic Christian doctrine in terms of the divinity of Christ and Christ as the unique Savior of the world. The Puritans have a heavy emphasis on God's sovereign power and rule over the universe and over human life. So that's part of why Franklin and other deists are struggling with the idea of God's providential involvement with human affairs. You know, they ask sensible questions like, well, if God is in control of everything, then why do so many bad things happen? And that's a source of doubt. The Puritans believe that God is so sovereign over everything that he's also in control of the eternal destinies of men and women. And so the Puritans classically do not believe in free will of people to decide their eternal fate. They believe that God, for reasons that only God fully understands, has chosen a certain number of people, the elect, that are called for salvation, and that people don't choose to be saved, that God has to choose and, in effect, cause them to be saved. And that's the kind of belief that many other devout Christians have come to challenge in subsequent American history. But, you know, the basic idea is that, of course, the Puritans are inheritors of the English Reformation. And the idea is that you base everything you believe in your Christian practice, family, life, everything on what the Bible teaches. And so they seek to implement that in, in all phases of life. It's quite intense. And that's the legacy of Franklin's childhood. We know from popular legend that Franklin was a largely self-educated man. Was the Bible the only book he would have read as a child? Or were there possibly other books that he could have read that would have influenced the way he thought about God and his faith? He read everything he could get his hands on. But early on, as a boy, his options were fairly limited. Of course, he had access to the Bible and various devotional type of texts, which he would read. I really mean it when I say he would read anything he could get his hands on. I think he read certainly everything that was in his house growing up, which was not a tremendous amount of material besides the Bible. His early favorite was John Bunyan, who is the author of The Pilgrim's Progress, which is you know, probably one of the most important books ever written in English, you know, the great Christian allegory of Pilgrim's journey to the celestial city. Franklin, like so many children, adults in his world and continuing on, in some contexts through today, people have read this and the literary brilliance of it, the compelling portrait of different kinds of characters that represent different sorts of virtues and vices and the temptations of the world and the glories of heaven. And Franklin was just enraptured by this. And even as he became a skeptic, he would praise Bunyan and his literary skill as one of his great models. And so there were other Christian authors that he was reading. I mean, most of what he read as a boy and a young man were coming out of that kind of Puritan tradition, of uh, English Reformation tradition, but also the classical literature and Greek and Roman antiquity, Plutarch's lives. In his world, if a boy is reading any text besides the Bible, Bunyan, Plutarch's lives, these sorts of reformed and then classical sources are just absolutely standard 
he also, as he got a bit older and into his teens, early 20s, began reading texts that he was interested in about this kind of practical religion, virtue-oriented religion, and especially people who were writing about being creative and doing good. And one of his favorite sources, it turns out, was the prominent pastor in Boston in his childhood, Cotton Mather, who, if you didn't know much about Franklin, you would think this is exactly the sort of person that Franklin wouldn't like, uh, because Cotton Mather is sort of seen as, you know, the ultimate Puritan fogey and persecutor of witches and so forth. But Mather also wrote a very popular book on essays to do good that Franklin really liked because it was thinking creatively about how Christians in particular could do the most good in society. He also read some things by Daniel Defoe, uh, the great author of Robinson Crusoe, many other books. But Defoe wrote about that kind of practical Christianity, too. And Franklin loved that sort of stuff. I think maybe one of the big turning points for Franklin was reading the essays by Joseph Addison and The Spectator coming out of England. And these were satirical essays, essays that also took a more virtue-oriented approach to Christianity that was critical of you know doctrinal strife and that sort of thing, and just really biting wit. And when Franklin read Addison for the first time, he was smitten. So I think that's kind of his early literary journey. Now, in 1723, at the mere age of 17, Franklin ran away from his home and family in Boston and made his way to Philadelphia. Thomas, would you tell us why Franklin ran away from Boston and why he chose to go to Philadelphia? Well, Franklin is, as a young man, as you know, early teens, is working as an assistant to his older brother, James Franklin, who is a printer in Boston. And so Ben Franklin is apprenticed to James Franklin, and for a time is serving as an indentured servant to his older brother, which is an awkward situation to be in, to say the least. Indentured servants are treated often right near the way that slaves would be treated, including with indiscriminate beatings and so forth if you didn't cooperate with your master. And so Ben Franklin, of course, is a big personality, does not lack for confidence, and it's inevitable that he and his brother would start fighting about the terms of Ben's work and the kind of service that he was providing to his older brother. They began fighting. James, Ben tells us, was even occasionally beating him as his servant, and it just became pretty quickly an intolerable situation for Ben Franklin. Without going into all the details, I mean, James was also at this time getting in trouble with Boston authorities because of some of the things that he was printing. And James was in so much trouble that he tried at one point to give Ben the lead on publishing their newspaper, the New England Courant, while at the same time expecting Ben to stay an indentured servant. And so he began with help from his friends, a plan to run away. It's a remarkable thing for someone who became so prominent in America, really the best known American of his time by the 1750s, that he began in such modest and difficult circumstances is quite amazing. And so he ultimately ran away from Boston, from his childhood background, from Puritanism. The way he presents it in in the autobiography, I think, has a sort of a taste of an exodus narrative of the liberation from captivity and out to freedom in Philadelphia. Why Philadelphia? I think he realized that there were opportunities for young men like him who had some trade skills, which he did in printing. And so he began to make connections with local printers in Philadelphia. And it wasn't too long before he began to make his own way as a printer in Philadelphia. Some people have called Pennsylvania the best poor man's country in colonial America. And I think at least for people like Ben Franklin, that was probably true. Philadelphia was a Quaker city. It was founded by Quakers. So What was it like for Franklin, who had such a strong Calvinist upbringing, to all of a sudden find himself in a city with such a different religious tradition? That's right. He found Philadelphia to be very different from what he was used to in Boston. Now, Boston, by the time Franklin is born in the early 1700s, had started to see some religious diversity really mandated by royal law. The Puritans had to accept the presence of other kinds of Protestants, at least which they had not in the early colonial period, but it was not nearly as diverse religiously or ethnically 
as Philadelphia was when he came to Philadelphia. And so one of the very first things that he does when he goes to Philadelphia is he goes to a Quaker meeting, like so many scenes in the autobiography. It's quite comical. He's there and in the Quaker meetings, they spend a lot of time not saying anything and waiting for the spirit to move. And he fell asleep. <laughs> and he said, this was the first house that I slept in in Philadelphia. It was the Quaker meeting house. But I think he began to get exposure to Presbyterians, which weren't so different from the Puritans, but Baptists, Quakers, Anglicans, a lot of different kinds of Christian groups. And I think that just began to open up vistas for him religiously, philosophically, and began to get him to wonder about what are the commonalities of all these different kinds of religions. And obviously for him, the most important commonality was the focus on virtue. Now, not long after Franklin arrived in Philadelphia, he set sail for London for the first time. That was in 1724. Thomas, what was Franklin's two-year stay in London like, and did this stay play any role in the development of his religious beliefs? Like for many people in the empire, going to London was a big deal for Franklin. No city anywhere close to the size of London anywhere else in the British Empire and Britain and America it was just titanic. So sights and scenes, unlike anything he had ever seen as a boy in Boston in particular. And it opened, again, even more doors to see different kinds of religious groups, to meet leading figures already of the English Enlightenment and deists. And he began to get exposed, not just through reading, but also in personal connections to these kind of leading deistic and Enlightenment writers in London. Bernard Mandeville, for instance, who was a leading skeptic and sort of a really provocative writer about issues about virtue and morality and religion. And it helped him to see that he might be able to model himself after these kinds of figures, which he had really not been able to meet even in places like Philadelphia. I think that London also opened him to a kind of bottoming out experience in his own personal morality. He got involved, tells openly that he was visiting prostitutes, that he was cheating with one of his best friend's girlfriends, and just he really presents it in the autobiography as the nadir of his moral life, maybe of any time in his whole life story. And he's seeing other friends of his who are going through similar experience and just they're washing out. They're drunks, they're completely broke. And I think Franklin at least the way he presents it is that he comes to this realization of, I've got to get my act together. I've got to just get some kind of moral conviction that helps to guide me in my life. And so when he goes back to Philadelphia after that year and a half or so trip to London, I think he resolves that now is the time when he's going to become a mature, responsible, virtuous man. And so that's at least the way he tells himself the story of, what that London trip did to him. In his quest to lead a good and moral life, Franklin developed a plan of conduct. Thomas, would you tell us about this plan? The plan of conduct is one of several documents like this that we have that he's left. We don't have an especially good record of what the original plan of conduct was. It's something that was printed in a 19th century source, but it's something along the lines of this plan for virtue the kinds of virtues you would expect from Franklin. Frugality, certainly one of them. He had gotten into some considerable debt, especially in London, and he says, I'm never going to let myself go there again. He commits himself to only speaking good of others publicly, controlling the tongue. He says of controlling his speech. He resolves that he'll always work hard, that he won't pursue any of these kind of get-rich-quick schemes that he saw some of his other friends chasing after. And so the plan of conduct becomes, for Franklin, a sort of moral guideline for how he's going to govern his life after bottoming out in London. But once again, you can see that it's a moral code. It's a code of virtue, but it's not connected to a particular doctrinal beliefs. And so you can see him shaping this kind of doctrinalist but moralized religion that he says, I've gone through my kind of season of sin and sowing my wild oats. Now I'm going to resolve on my own, through my own moral effort, to do better. And so you don't necessarily, in this kind of system, need a conversion experience the way that his evangelical sister, Jane Mecom, would have said, or his 
pastor friend George Whitfield would have said, but you don't need that kind of conversion experience. You can just change yourself through moral effort and resolving to be a virtuous person. Now, as Thomas mentioned, Franklin made his way back to Philadelphia and set himself up as a printer in 1727. And upon his return, Franklin really started to try to find a church-like experience, if you will, without having to necessarily attend an actual church service. Thomas, would you tell us about Franklin's need to join or create clubs that provided him with a communal church-like experience? I think that Franklin, again, because of his childhood, he thought that a virtuous person should go to church, even if you didn't necessarily believe everything that was being preached. He thought it was just a good thing to go to church, to be committed and practicing and part of a religious society, which most people are going to find in church. But he had a really hard time coming up with a church that he could stand. And the Presbyterian pastor in Philadelphia at the time really kept after him, you know, you need to come to our church and so forth. And he would try But then he would feel like that all they were preaching was just dry doctrine and kind of pointless stuff that didn't really accord with his beliefs. So he did settle out eventually once he got married to Deborah Reed. Deborah, I think, was a more traditional, devout Church of England person than he was. And she wanted to go to the Anglican Church of England, Christ Church, Philadelphia. So he would go with her when he was in Philadelphia. But you see him constantly kind of tinkering with well, maybe we could have these kind of clubs, groups that are for sort of discussions about virtue and moral philosophy and so forth, but that don't necessarily need to be in the context of a church per se. And so he founds and that thinks about founding several of these kind of groups. Probably the most famous is the Junto there in Philadelphia, which is you know a group of young tradesmen mostly who discuss these kind of issues, you know, virtue and morality and philosophy, new learning. And they talk about issues like, is there any need in the city that we feel like that we can do something to ameliorate and help with in a charitable sense? You know, is there anyone who's in some kind of dire straits that we can be of assistance to? But it's not in the context of a church at all. So he's kind of tinkering with ideas in many ways, you know, could you have the benefits of church and religion without the formal institutional context of a church building and church doctrines? A couple of times during our conversation, you mentioned Franklin's sister, Jane Meekham. Franklin spent many years grappling with the tension between his upbringing as a Calvinist and his later ideas about virtue, morality, and theology. And after we talk about our episode sponsor for a moment, I wonder if you would tell us about this tension that Franklin experienced and how his relationship with his sister, Jane Meekham, helped him grapple with this tension. This week, we're commemorating Ben Franklin's 312th birthday by exploring his religious life and world. Now, if you'd like to learn even more about Ben Franklin, you should visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld, sign up for the free trial that they're offering you, and check out their course, America's Founding Fathers. The Great Courses Plus teamed up with the Smithsonian to create this course, and among its 36 different video lectures, you'll find a 26-minute video titled Benjamin Franklin's Leather Apron, which you can watch for free during your free trial. In Benjamin Franklin's Leather Apron, Professor Alan Gelzo will take you through the life of Benjamin Franklin and show you the many roles he played in the formative years of the Republic. Roles such as an independent printer, public gentleman, nobleman of nature, and a tradesman who was actually quite cynical of the wealthy and powerful. While you're checking out The Great Courses Plus, you'll see that it has over 8,500 lectures in its vast library that can help you satisfy your curiosity about all sorts of subjects, like history, science, math, psychology, and even how to perform new skills, like photography, cooking, and speaking a new language. All of these fascinating lectures are presented by award-winning professors and experts in easy-to-watch 30-minute long videos that you can stream, download, and watch all on your own schedule and on all your favorite mobile devices. So visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld to extend your exploration of history and to delve into new topics just because they fascinate you. To claim your free trial of The Great Courses Plus, visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. So Thomas, would you tell us about the tension that Franklin experienced between his Calvinist upbringing and his later ideas about virtue, morality, and theology? And would you tell us about his relationship with his sister Jane Meekham and how she helped him grapple with this tension? 
I think grappling is the right word, especially as he dealt with his own moral failings and disappointments with the way he acted, and especially in situations like the London trip. And just realizing that whatever he believes specifically about doctrine, that he just couldn't keep living like this, you know, visiting prostitutes and way in debt and all this kind of thing. This is not the kind of life I want to be known for living. But he knows enough that he doesn't feel like he can go back to his parents' kind of traditional faith. And so he pushes forward with that kind of plan of conduct, believing that he can shape his own life through just moral effort. And he tries that for a long time, but he has these voices around him. And Jane Mecom is probably the most persistent through the years of people who were saying to him that moral effort is not enough, that you need a change of heart. And this is the traditional Christian evangelical teaching on this is that while morality and virtue are really important, you can't really just make this happen through your own efforts. You have to have the transformative power of a conversion experience that then will lead to a life, hopefully, of virtue and morality and charity. And so I think that he and Jane would routinely talk about this in letters. Unfortunately, most of Jane's letters to Ben are lost. Sadly, they were probably just trashed at some point with people believing, here's a woman in the 18th century, it's not that important what she said, makes you want to pull your hair out. And she's also a poor woman, too, to boot. She never becomes wealthy at all, unlike Ben. But anyway, we know enough to intuit that they would sometimes talk about this and would become quite contentious. It's clear that there's one episode where Ben visits Jane in Boston and that they have a fight about this. And I think what the fight is, is Jane saying, you're trying to do all this on your own. But what you don't see is that you need God in your life to help you live a moral, virtuous life, and you need to put your faith in Christ for salvation. You knew that was the truth from our growing up. Why have you turned away from that? And Ben says, I don't need that. (laughs) And you can imagine it going downhill from there. And we do have a letter from him to her where he's sort of trying to make up with her and kind of, sorry, we fought and this kind of thing. But you can tell from the references that that's what they talked about. But I think that that kind of influence acted as a sort of tether on Franklin, who might otherwise have gone into really radical skepticism, you know, maybe even approaching even kind of atheism. But that persistent influence, especially of Jane Mecom in his life, I think helped him to, on a personal level, to stay closer to the traditional faith of Jane and Ben's childhood than Ben Franklin might have otherwise. Another important person in Franklin's life is also someone you mentioned earlier, George Whitfield. Would you tell us about George Whitfield and how he and Franklin became friends? This is a really fascinating relationship in Franklin's life story because George Whitfield is the most famous evangelical preacher of the era. He's the most important evangelical preacher of the Great Awakening of the mid 1700s. And Whitfield is a titanic celebrity before Franklin is. And really, Franklin's fame probably really doesn't even approach Whitfield's level of fame until maybe the time of the American Revolution. So it's a strange relationship because why is Franklin friends with this evangelical preacher where he doesn't really agree with at least some of what he's preaching about, about salvation, heaven and hell, and this kind of thing? It starts off as a business relationship for sure, because in the late 1730s, Franklin meets Whitfield, and they agree that Franklin can publish a number of Whitfield's materials, including some Whitfield's sermons, Whitfield's travel journals, which are phenomenally popular. And I think it starts with Franklin thinking that he can just make a ton of money off of Whitfield. He sees Whitfield as a cash cow, like nothing he's ever seen before. And he does. He makes a lot of money off of publishing Whitfield's materials. And the entire publishing output of the colonial presses almost doubles in a couple of years because of Whitfield's celebrity and the sensational ministry that he has both in Britain and in America. But over time, I think they also become friends. They become close friends, as a matter of fact, and they understand each other in a special way, I think because of their common experience of celebrity. By the time you get to the 1750s, Franklin has become quite famous too. 
And of course, a celebrity, as we know today, can become quite isolating. It's difficult to have friends and so forth. And so I think that's part of what brings them together. But Franklin also sees Whitfield as somebody who's honestly trying to do good because of his religion. Franklin really admires Whitfield's great charitable project, which is an orphanage in Georgia, the Bethesda Orphanage. That's Whitfield's great charitable project of his career. And Franklin gives money to support that, helps to publicize it. And they even at one point talk about possibly founding a colony together in the Ohio River Territory. Doesn't really go anywhere, but that shows you that Franklin sees Whitfield as somebody he can make common cause with. And Franklin is capable of just sort of setting aside their doctrinal differences if it leads to the greater good in terms of charity and virtue. So I think that's the nature of their connection. Now, speaking of Franklin the celebrity, Franklin largely became famous because of his scientific work with electricity. And this leaves us to really wonder how Franklin the scientist reconciled his belief in science with his faith in God. Well, I think Franklin saw his science as an outworking of his religious commitments. And so much of the kind of scientific work that he was doing had benevolent purposes, as he saw it, especially his work on lightning rods, which he thought would do enormous good if implemented to reducing house fires and lightning strikes on houses that destroyed so many houses at that time. So he saw science as a way to alleviate those kinds of social and physical problems that society had at the time. And so he saw absolutely no contradiction between science and his kind of religious views because they're both focused on practical goodness and morality. Now, there were more traditional critics of Franklin. Some people, and it's not a large number of people, but I think some people even questioned the idea of trying to deflect lightning away from houses or people and so forth that would say, now look, lightning bolts is one of the most common ways that God brings judgment on people. So I don't think we ought to try to mess with that. You know, of course, Franklin just thought that was just silly. And if God is giving us the means to understand what lightning is, and Franklin's great accomplishment is demonstrating that lightning is in fact electrical fire, as they would call it back then. If God gives us the means to understand that and to deflect it, then surely there's nothing wrong with trying to protect ourselves. And Franklin is very much in a community of his scientific associates are also pastors and people of you know serious religious conviction. So it never would have occurred to Franklin in his context that there was a contradiction. When you read Thomas's book, Benjamin Franklin, The Religious Life of a Founding Father, you really get the idea that Franklin spent a lifetime wrestling with ideas about faith, morality, and virtue. Thomas, did Franklin ever come to any final conclusions about those things? I mean... Did he ever find or espouse a definitive form of faith? By the end of his life, I think he had settled out on some very basic beliefs that he had. Most obviously that if religion is worth anything, it will result in virtue and that that's the most important thing. He did have some doctrinal convictions in spite of the fact that I talk about his religion as doctrinal, as moralized Christianity. He does say that he believes in one God that God's somehow ruling by his providence, that God should be worshipped, that there will be a future judgment of people by God, and that the best way that we can serve God is to serve our fellow man. I mean, these are pretty minimal convictions, but nevertheless theistic. So whatever we understand by deism, I mean, I think he does have a fairly grounded kind of theism, but he's very hesitant about making any kind of specifically Christian doctrinal commitments. And it turns out that he wrote a letter to Ezra Stiles, the president of Yale College, five weeks before Franklin died. He responded to a letter that Stiles had written to him, asking him about his religion, specifically asking him about Jesus. And Franklin told Stiles that he thought that Jesus's ethical teachings were the greatest that the world had ever seen and certainly worthy of emulation, but that he had never been able to quite except the idea that Jesus was divine, that Jesus was the Son of God. And so I think in a traditional Christian sense, I don't see any way that he could be regarded as a Christian at the end of his life, even though those kind of theistic principles and the outworking of religion and charity are so important to him. We know a lot about Benjamin Franklin, and I wonder... Why do you think it's important that we consider Franklin as a man of faith when we consider him and all of his various accomplishments in early America? 
I think if we want to understand Franklin, we've got to understand what was important to him. And as I suggested earlier, I mean, he wrote vast amounts of material on, I think, more than any other subject. He's writing about religion, especially early in his life. And he's capable of getting involved in some very in-depth technical doctrinal debates in 1730s and so forth. And it continues through his life to be a major interest and concern of his. So I think even if you know, we're not especially religious ourselves or you know whatever, I mean, if we look at Franklin and only see the scientist and the diplomat and so forth, we're missing a part that he considered to be quite important himself. And it also has that kind of overshadowing legacy that if you don't know this about Franklin, you'll miss all kinds of references that often are just phrases little stories, anecdotes, and so forth. But it's the way that he made sense of the world himself was through these kind of biblical, biblicist categories. And so in that way, he is a representative 18th century figure, child of the Puritans, and it's very hard to understand him without it. Let's jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. the time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Benjamin Franklin had stayed in Boston and somehow found a way to open his print shop there? How would his remaining in Boston have affected his career and the development of his faith and religious ideas? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I wonder if he might have at that point not broken into this kind of international renown, because I do think that Boston probably would have been both professionally and even religiously more limiting for him. Franklin is, among other things, just a really lucky person. I mean, he has an incredible knack for making connections with people. He's a social genius. I think his greatest genius is probably in his social relations. So maybe he would have made the same kind of connections, but I wonder if he had stayed in Boston, if very few of us would remember him. I think going to Philadelphia, then going to London really was key to setting up the kind of international renown that he ends up having. Thomas, you've written eight books. What can we look forward to in book number nine? Well, I've got a couple of things in the pipeline. I'm actually working on a couple of different textbooks right now. One is an overall American history textbook and then a more focused book on American religious history. And then after that, I've already done a bit of the groundwork for a biography of Thomas Jefferson that I think I'm going to write. It It may not be quite as focused on religion, but like Franklin, Jefferson is consumed in some ways by religion. So I think he's susceptible to the same sort of treatment. If we still have questions about Benjamin Franklin and his religious life, how can we contact you? Well, I'm very active on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Thomas S. Kidd. And you can find pretty much anything you wanted to know about my work, you can find at Twitter as a jumping off point. Thomas Kidd, thank you for helping us better understand the world of Benjamin Franklin by taking us through his religious life. Thank you very much for having me. Historically, we remember Ben Franklin as an accomplished printer, scientist, and statesman. Someone who came from humble beginnings and really made his own way in the world. But rarely do we remember Ben Franklin as a man of faith. And as Thomas revealed, Religion and faith were very important subjects to Franklin. In fact, he wrote about those subjects more than he wrote about any other topics during his lifetime. And we all know how prolific Franklin was. Throughout his life, Franklin believed in the ideas of practical morality and virtue. He believed that the best way to serve God was to serve his fellow man. And this was part of the ideological impetus that caused Franklin to found so many different social organizations around the ideas of exploring virtue and morality and in conducting charitable works. It's also, in part, what drove his scientific experimentation. As Thomas noted, Franklin believed in God, and he saw answers to questions about how God's world worked. Franklin viewed his experiments with electricity and in other areas as true outworks for his religious commitments. And he sought through his inventions, like the lightning rod, to make the world around him a better place. Franklin grappled with ideas about morality, virtue, and theology throughout his entire life. His writings and interactions with Jane Meekham, George Whitfield, and with other scientists and theologians like Ezra Stiles make clear that 
Franklin understood the world around him through biblical categories. And although Franklin ran away from Boston at a young age, he never could quite run away from his Puritan upbringing. In many ways, the Calvinism of his youth always shaped his thoughts, ideas, questions, and actions, making him forever a true man of faith and religion. Look for more information about Thomas, his book, Benjamin Franklin, The Religious Life of a Founding Father, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 169. If you haven't yet joined our listener newsletter and community, you should do so now. It's as easy as texting BF World to 33444. The Great Courses Plus can help you learn even more about Benjamin Franklin and about so many other topics because they offer more than 8,500 video courses. You can explore this extensive course library for free when you claim your free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. Holly White provided production assistance for this episode. Holly, thanks so much for helping us keep this podcast going. Finally, does knowing more about Ben Franklin's religious ideas and beliefs change how you understand him? I'd love to know, so send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.